Uh, welcome guys, this is our session on the connected cars in the marketplace. Uh, my name is Jason Hoover, I'm with uh, Capital One, I do software engineering. Uh, I met Mike last year as we started playing with the uh, hardware POC and some stuff that we were kind of pulling around with. Uh, and then this topic of this talk came up and we sort of generated it from there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, he's going to take over the first half of the session and then I'll come back and talk about uh, a little more of the, uh, the future tech that we're talking about as uh, part of the new marketplace. Thank you. Thanks Jason. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, so, I'm Mike Simmons. I'm a, uh, a reformed Detroit car industry guy, um, transplanted both, I guess, physically and spiritually to Silicon Valley. So I've been trying to make stuff happen in the connected car space for the last, uh, better part of the last decade. I, uh, you know, developed the first iPhone-based remote car starter and helped kick off the usage-based insurance market in, in the U.S. M recently, I was, uh, the last couple of years, I was helping to grow the automatic business. If you know, automatic is kind of the first of the Fitbit for the cars. Um, and uh, now I'm the CEO of a company called Driveway, which has uh, developed and patented the, um, the smartphone telematics technology, which is kind of the next the next big thing in usage-based insurance space. So I've done a lot of stuff around the connected car, so so um, that's why I'm here. But uh, the, the agenda today, we're gonna kind of put it in, in two halves. I'm gonna talk about the first half, um, which is about, so what is the connected car, kind of defining the connected car, and talking about the, why we should even care about it while we're all sitting here, um, talk a little bit about the business models that exist today around the connected car, and then Jason's gonna spend the second half talking about the future and what, what that looks like around the connected car. So, um, the, uh, the to, to the why should we care question, uh, there's, I don't know if you've noticed in the last few years, but uh, you know, rewind like six or seven years ago, and the auto industry was a much different place, right? You had the CEOs of most of the auto industry back in, in D.C. asking for handouts, you know, right before they bankrupted their companies, um, and it, flying on their corporate jets, by the way. Uh, but it was kind of a mess, right? And now fast forward a few years, and all of a sudden the car business is, is really hot again, right? It's cool to be a, a car guy. Um, and it's just that whole dynamic is pretty interesting and I'll give you a little bit of my perspective on, on why that's happened in case you guys are wondering why uh, all that has happened. It's, and it's really, I, when I look at it I, it, I think it's driven by there's sort of four major disruptive forces going on and that are really changing the car biz, business and, and opening it up for massive disruption. And I'll try to do a, a you know, sort of the one sentence exploration of, of, of what's driving that. It'll be one long rambling run on sentence, but, uh, but try, to, try to speak to it concisely. So really, the, and the reason we're talking about the connected car here is because connectivity is sort of the first of those four disruptive technologies. It's sort of the plumbing layer that's enabling all this stuff to happen, and what it's enabling are new models around car ownership, i.e. car sharing, uh, things like Uber. Um, it's enabling that, and it's enabling things like electrification and battery-powered cars, which are fundamentally transforming what cars are and how they're built. They look more like a smartphone on wheels than a, than a traditional car these days. Um, and that enables a couple things, the sustainability of, of transport and cars, um, but it also enables new entrants to get into the space, because if you look at the supply chain around a car that looks like a smartphone on wheels, very different players are sort of qualified to play in that space. So that's why you see folks like Google and Apple and Tesla and Uber getting into the car business, right? They're all talking about building cars now. Um, that's one really fundamentally transformative thing. And it all leads to the, the fourth one, which is kind of the holy grail, which is autonomous driving, right? Everybody's been talking about autonomous driving. I don't know if everybody stops and thinks why it's such a big deal um, all the time, but you know why it's such a big deal is a couple things. One, it's completely transformative in, in terms of the uh, this impact on safety on the roads and road safety. But more importantly, its impact on the economics of driving is really what's making what's driving all that change. Right? It's always about the economics ultimately, and just about any major disruption. So, uh, just a kind of a quick eye chart to, to explain that a little bit better. Um, when you look at the economics today. Of, of driving that's kind of in the middle there, those two middle bars. You know, it's about 50 cents to a buck a mile if, if you look at the, the 12,000 miles a year that everybody drives. It kind of averages out to between 50 cents and a buck a mile depending on the type of car you drive. And you compare that to Uber today, um, and if I'm driving in an Uber, it's gonna cost somewhere between, you know, about two and three bucks depending on where you are and when you're driving. Um, so it's more expensive to drive in an Uber, and, and you know, so if you're doing the average mileage, 
uh, that most customers do, you don't have the opportunity. It doesn't make economic sense to ditch your car at this point unless you live in the city and you don't use your car that much. So most people, it doesn't make sense yet. But fast forward a couple decades to the autonomous driving future, and all of a sudden, there's almost no circumstance where it makes economic sense to own a car, right? So now, in every circumstance, except you know, if you live in rural Montana, you're better off just basically renting your, your transportation by the mile, right? And so that's what's driving this big disruptive change. So what goes along with that are so many different things that disrupt um, not just you know, what cars look like and who drives them, but how cities are laid out and how much real estate we allocate to parking and, um, and you know, road safety like we talked about. So many different things completely changes you know, so many different second order effects of society that that's the really big impactful thing. And that's why when you look at companies like Google and Apple and Uber and all the big, you know, the, 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 the most impressive companies out there, that's why they're looking at the space because they see this massive industry. Yes, it's low margin, yes, it's low growth, but in terms of spend, it's basically the biggest industry out there and it's ripe for disruption. And so that's really what's driving it. And you think about um, you know, autonomous driving, and autonomous driving is really already here. And it's not the Google cars that are driving around Mountain View, right? It's Uber. Uber is really a surrogate for autonomous driving. That's sort of hacking autonomous driving now. The only difference is you've got the algorithm that's, that's driving the cars right now is not all that great. It's kind of it's, it's the, what, what somebody, I forget who, who coined this, so I'm not gonna take credit for it, but it's the meat-based algorithm that sits in the front seat, right? They're just not that good yet. It's too expensive and it's not really that good, not that great of a, that, that safe of a driver. But once you replace that meat-based algorithm with a software algorithm that's really, really good, that's when everything changes, right? It becomes, the car safety uh, uh, goes up and the economics completely change. So, why we talk about all that, why we're here is to sort of talk about the first, the first level um, uh, the, you know, foundational technology there, which is getting cars connected. Until you get cars connected, you don't have a, this opportunity here. So what's happening now is the next probably couple decades are going to be the hacks along the way to that autonomous future, right? So that's what we're doing. Every disruptive technology it doesn't start overnight. It starts with a series of little hacks that gets closer and closer to the goal line, right? And that's what we see today. So, you know, what is a connected car? If you define it in sort of uh, customer terms, customers usually define things in terms of the value that they get and kind of the content that they, they, uh, they, they get or the services that they get. So there's a lot of different definitions and they're all, none of them are wrong, right? So a lot of people think about it as, as the infotainment system. If it's you know, Sirius or Pandora, that's a connected car to me. Some people think if I push a button on my steering wheel and I can talk to my head unit, that's, that's a connected car. Uh, some people think of a connected car as some of the new stuff that's coming on the new platforms like CarPlay and, and Android Auto. Uh, some fo folks think of it as the, the, all these new apps that are being built for you know, either by OEMs or third parties that are meant to be consumed inside the car, you know, parking apps, uh, um, things like you know, Spotify apps, all those, all those are sort of part of the connected car ecosystem. And then there's this whole world of the outside the car apps, which is a lot of the stuff that, that uh, my previous company, Automatic, we were doing, um, which is building an ecosystem of apps around sort of the, helping the, make a, the, the car ownership experience better. And then there's a whole world of connected services, things like automatic crash notification or roadside assistance or things like usage-based insurance. People think of that as connected car. None of it's wrong, it's just all in, in sort of a broad definition. We haven't really really honed in on one specific definition, but it all the, the, the common thread is it all takes some sort of connection to the cloud, right? If you look at it from kind of the supply side of what technology platforms are out there creating this connectivity, um, there's really six major ones that, as, as I define it, um, the first one, you know, probably the oldest one, one of the oldest ones is, is satellite, Sirius XM, right? That's, that's the old school, one way beamed into the car. It's not even two way communication, but you got satellites pushing content into the car. So that was sort of the first order of, uh, of connected car. And then kind of alongside of that, almost the same time you have things like OnStar, which now that's the, you know, what we consider an OEM embedded uh, technology platform. So that's the, the OEM has built a cell, a, a cell radio into the car. Now I've got two-way communication from the car to the cloud. I don't have to be in the car or anything like that. Um, OnStar was kind of the first to, 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 to push that. Then you have what they call OEM tethered solutions, which is it's OnStar, but it doesn't work unless I, my cell phone's in the car. And so I built some hardware in the car. It's kind of like first generation Ford Sync. I built some hardware into the car, but it only works when my cell phone's in the car and it tethers to the cell phone, and that's my connection to the cloud. So it's a more cost-effective way to do that. Um, and then you've got the aftermarket solutions. 
There's aftermarket cellular solutions like Verizon Hum, if you've seen the commercials for Verizon Hum, that's a, I've got a cellular radio, I plug it into the car, it's a separate piece of hardware, and now my car's connected, I can do two-way communication. You've got aftermarket tethered solutions, which are, again, a more cost-effective way to do that. I plug a, a device into my car, and then it talks to my cell phone, and my cell phone talks to the cloud. Um, and then the, the last one is, is, that's what I'm doing now at, at driveway, um, that's, the, uh, that's essentially a virtual connection to the car, right? So now if I take all the, the you've got a supercomputer in your pocket now, right? And what, you take all those sensors and mash it up, and you can get signals from the car, and you can have a virtual connection to the car, so you know when you're driving, you know how you're driving. The technology's evolved to the point now where insurance companies, that's why they're all moving that direction, because it's, it's a friction-free way to create a connected car. You can just do it with a smartphone app, and then there's not hardware involved, so it's, it's really, really growing fast. So those are kind of the, the six um, uh, big technology platforms for connected car. Um, now, as show, show of hands, how many people have a car with an OBD port in it? All right, so it's kind of a trick question. If you do have a car, then you, you're pretty sure you have an OBD port in it. It's like the one thing in all cars that's, that's standard. If you have a car that's, old, that's newer than 1996, you've got an OBD port in it. Just problems nobody knows where it is. It's kind of buried under the steering wheel there. But why that's important is a lot of these business models are, are, are built off of a connection to the OBD port. It's sort of like a, you know, almost like a USB connection into, into your car computer. So why that exists, why it's there, why every car has one is it was federally mandated, right? It's the one thing that every car has. Um, and you can plug into it and you can get a certain, certain set of data off of every car, the same set of data. It's a limited set of data that you get the same data. And why, it, why it, it, it's in place is kind of a couple of reasons. One is it was a mission, an emission controls uh, um, device, so a lot of states have smog check and you have to send your car in to make sure it's not polluting, so that's the place you go plug in and, and check on that. But it also enables independent garage repair, so that in the, the, it, was, it was really driven by a consumer protection law that was trying to prevent the OEMs and car dealers from monopolizing car service, right? So this, this is a way to help make sure that, that independent garages can, can provide service and customers have more choice. Um, but it's also a bit like, I think about it as, it's sort of a, a, the USB stick that you plug into your laptop to get it connected to the, to the cloud, except with sort of AOL version one, where you didn't get access to everything. You, you got access to just what AOL let, let you get to, right? So that's, that's, that's kind of a subset of the data that you can access. And you've got all these different business models that evolved from that plug-in connection. Um, Verizon Hum, we talked about, that's, that's one. Uh, Automatic is one. They've done a lot to, we did a lot uh, to, to sort of grow consumer awareness around the category. Um, and now you've got a bunch of new entrants. Everybody's getting into the space. Samsung just announced a couple weeks ago they've got their own device to connect. Um, and you've got a bunch of other MeToo products like Binley and Mojio and, and those that are, that, are, that are coming also. Um, so a lot of different uh, business models built off of plugging into that port. Um, and uh, what do you get from that port? So this subset of data, sort of the AOL subset of data, uh, you get some really important data points, but you don't get them all. So you get things like, um, like the VIN, so you know exactly what car it is. You have certain, you know, certainty on, on which car it is. You get high frequency speed, so you know every second how fast the car is going. So you can use some of that data to turn it into interesting stuff around driver behavior, and that's what the insurance companies like. Um, and a bunch of other stuff like RPMs and airflow and engine temperature, sort of inside the engine, outside the engine, um, and things like diagnostic trouble codes. So some of those are really exciting and can be the, 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 the data you need to create a new service experience. Um, what you don't get uh, universally are a bunch of what they call proprietary PIDs. So this is the information that the OEMs let, give access to, but they're not required to, so they lock it down and they only let dealers that invest in really expensive scan tools get to it. So there's ways to get it by reverse engineering and there's some folks out there doing it, but it's, it doesn't scale, right? It's really, you can't get every car on the road. You can't get the same data from every car on the road. It's a monstrous effort. It just changes too fast. So most of those business models are built around the data that I can access from every car, right? They use that limited set of data and they create a, uh, an experience around it. So some of the, the sort of, you know, the holy grail data points that you can't get to that everybody wants are things like odometer, like exactly what does my odometer say? So I have specific mileage intervals, that kind of thing. Um, Seatbelt status, airbag status. I want to know if it, the airbag went off so I can make that a, a crash response experience. Um, and then controls, things like, can I unlock my doors from my smartphone? It's like you can't do that, generally speaking, unless you do a big reverse engineering exercise or you're splicing wires, that kind of thing. So some of those, those models, that's why you don't see them, you know, the more ubiquitous models. And part of the reason I think that you don't see that more is um, 
this all this noise we've heard recently about car hacking, right? Everybody's worried about is this something I should really worry about, or is it just a you know a thing, a PR thing? So I'll give you some of my perspective on it. Um, it's you know it's a real thing, but it's always a matter of degrees, right? There's there are um, good hacks and bad hacks, or, or none of them are good, but there's bad hacks and there's really bad hacks, right? So the generally speaking, most of this data and most of these business models are about reading data out of the data bus. So if you read data, it's like you can do some bad stuff. You can figure out where your customers are going and stuff. And in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not all that bad. But when you talk about right data, like going in and controlling, you know, steering and brakes and all that kind of stuff, you know, which is possible in some cases, that's when it gets really dangerous. So that's why sort of the movement is to kind of lock that down and encrypt it and secure it more. Um, and you're going to see more and more concern about that, locking down those, those parts of the system. Um, but I think the tech takeaway is it's not, it's, there, there are different ways to get to that data. It's not just the OBD port, that's a, that's a threat vector. If you look, you know, this is a picture from, from Charlie Miller, the famous uh, um, hack that was done that got a lot of publicity. They didn't go in through the OBD port, they went in through an OEM radio that was built by a tier one supplier, and they had a back door to get into it, and that's where all the bad stuff happened. They had a, a, a threat vector that nobody really knew about, that's why it was so, uh, um, they were able to do some, some really bad stuff. Um, I think the takeaway is it's not it's not just about the OBD port. It's not even just about connected cars. It's about everything around the Internet of Things, right? Security is really paramount, right? You need to lock this stuff down. You need to get good at it, or bad stuff can happen, right? They literally drove the car off the road. So it was a bit sensationalized, but as, if it's real, if it's something that can happen, you better take it seriously. So one, just a couple perspectives on where this connectivity, these platforms are going in the future. I think there's a couple trends that are worth noting. One is the, a few years ago, there was still some debate, I think, around whether every car is going to be connected or not, whether there's going to be you know, some sort of cellular connection inside of the car to connect that car to the cloud. I think that debate is over now. I think the, the use case has been proven that there's enough value there that, that it's worth it for the OEM to invest in that cellular connection. And a lot of it's been proven out by Tesla, right? Tesla, there's a reason that it's getting all these phenomenal ratings being the best car ever made. Part of it's because you can software update the thing over the air. So you can push out a car and you're not, you know, today every car on the road, once it leaves the factory, you're done, right? You get what you get. With a Tesla, every few weeks, it's a new car. You get new features added to it. You fix bugs, all that kind of stuff. That's just too important. You're gonna, every car in the future is gonna be some variant of that, right? It's just, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Um, so I think that's one big trend. Another big trend is, your smartphones just keep getting smarter, right? They keep getting the sensor technology. They're, they're the most powerful computers out there now. Um, <clears throat> so you can do more and more stuff. And if you lean on software harder, you can you can make virtual connections, kind of like what we've done at Driveway. You can you can with, with sensor fusion technology and getting other signals from the car. You can pretty much tell, hey, I'm in a car. I'm not in a car. I know which car I'm in. I know how the car is driving. All a lot of those it doesn't give you all the data points. It won't give you a diagnostic code, that kind of stuff. But it gives you a lot of the signals that, that make these business models possible. So I think you're going to see those two bookends of the spectrum really really grow in the future. Um, so today's business model is just kind of ticking through some of the, the interesting, uh, important ones, kind of one example of each. So the first one, the fundamental one, is usage-based insurance, right? Every time anybody talks about the connected car, their mind immediately goes to, I'm going to monetize this through insurance. It's because there's a clear, proven use case. Insurers want to get better information on how their customers actually drive, then they can price them more fairly, more appropriately. It's a win-win for the insurance company and the customer, and there's money to be made in it, right? So, so everybody, that, that's the, the sort of the long pole in the tent in terms of, of uh, you know, value propositions and business models around the connected car. It's a part of almost everybody's thinking. Um, another one is what we did at Automatic, which was build a really great experience around the connected car and then sell somebody the hardware that enables it, right? And so we'll make our money off of selling you some hardware. There'll be other ways we can make money in the future, but it's primarily a sell, you know, make margin off of hardware. Um, another variant of that is like what Verizon's doing. It's I'm going to sell, I'm going to build a really good customer experience around a piece of hardware, um, but I'm going to sell it to you on a subscription basis. So 15 bucks a month. Here's the hardware that makes it all work, and you've got a great connected experience. And I'm going to charge you 15 bucks a month. Um, Another category of business models is the solve a problem around the connected car, a point solution for certain customers, right? So you've got uh, a company like MileIQ, they just got bought by Microsoft, but all they do is 
they make business expense reporting with mileage uh, better, right? Take the friction and all the hand, you know, uh, there's a few companies that do this, but all the old handwritten, you know, it's a pain, it's a complete pain, right? So they can make this a magical experience. And I do a freemium model, it says I'll give you some of this stuff for free, and then, uh, um, and if you're a real power user, I'm gonna charge you six bucks a month. So sort of point solution uh, around uh, solving the problem. And there's another one, which is the sort of transaction fee model. So I'm gonna build a, a solution that uses connectivity to the car, to try and make the car service experience better. Um, and every time one of the, the providers in my service network uh, provides service, I'm gonna take a transaction fee from them. So that's another, another model that some folks are, are doing uh, today. And an interesting new one that's you know, sort of starting to get into the world of, of advertising and media, which I think is kind of cool, is a company called Rapify, which is basically they turn your car into a mobile billboard and you drive around uh, and, and you know, you basically create ad impressions and they use the connected car to figure out how many ad impressions you're creating and where you've been and how many eyeballs uh, are, see the car and then they pay the driver for it so it's kind of a cool cool new uh, uh, spin on the business model um, and then from there I'll do so, so Jason's going to take you what, through what the future looks like but I'll leave one uh, one kernel of an idea for uh, a, a, a fun um, if not dystopian uh, version of the future that gets enabled when you go back to that chart that we looked at before about the economics of driving, right? One, some of the stuff that gets enabled when those costs change so much. So, you know, 25 cents a mile or so for, for driving, now all of a sudden you have the ability to turn this model completely upside down and say, I'm not gonna, you know, instead of me being Uber and charging you a per mile fee for driving you around, now big brands can come in and say, you know what, at that price, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use your attention as currency and I'm gonna say, you know, I'll give you a free ride somewhere, but I'm gonna strap you in and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna pay attention to what I've got to show you or sell you, right? I'm, you know, this is a, a friend, friend of mine, uh, Michael DiTullo sketched this idea out uh, a little while back. It's, you know, sort of the Starbucks robo-taxi, right? Starbucks can, can, if they make margin off the service or the attention that they can, they can get from you uh, to sell you their new product at 25 cents a mile, that's a pretty cheap, uh, um, you know, that's a pretty, pretty cheap date. That's what I call it, the new CPM, right? It's not CPMs aren't cost per thousand impressions anymore. It's cost per mile. Of, you know how much, how many miles of captive driving experience can I can I put in front of you? So you know things like this are going to be possible when we get to that uh, that future. But Jason's going to really tell you about uh, what that future looks like next. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, so Mike just gave a great overview of the connected car and uh, what's been going on, how it evolved, and what it looks like today. So I want to take you on a, a little explanation of what I think the future might hold. And I'm going to do this from more of a tech perspective. Uh, so when we're talking about this from my perspective, I'm thinking about this from uh, APIs and SOCs. So an API is an application programming interface. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically an endpoint on the internet that uh, any company or third party can expose uh, that you can take advantage of by calling it, getting information back from it, uh, or sending information and getting some sort of decision made about it. Uh, and SOCs are systems on chips. So this is the hardware, right? This is kind of an integral and important part about what we've been talking about with connected car. You can have all the software you want in an app, but the app is only going to be constrained to a smartphone. You're going to need something like a piece of hardware for it to interact to to get more data from sensors uh, and get data from other, other aspects. Uh, so if you're at all curious about that, you've heard the latest news about Cruise, which was the $2,000 piece of hardware you could make your car autonomous just bought for a billion dollars, more than a billion, by a GM more than an acquire than a purchase, but uh, there's a lot of money in that space still. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the API landscape. So anytime you're working with APIs, you have this need to take your data and kind of marshal it along through a workflow, especially if you're trying to create some sort of service for somebody. Uh, so you need something that's gonna watch for an event, uh, do something with that event, respond to it, and do something else. Uh, so there's APIs and uh, apps out there like uh, IFTT, uh, the if this, then that, uh, and Zapier. These are basically workflow APIs that you can use to watch for an event and then do something. It's basically the if this, then that. Uh, you also have the OBD2 device vendors. So uh, companies like uh, Automatic and Driveway will have uh, an API portal that, uh, in an OAuth function. So they could actually, if, you're, if they're a customer of yours, you could actually have them log in, go out, do an OAuth authentication back to the company and say, yes, please share my driving data with this company. Uh, then you have things like IBM Watson that's coming up uh, with Alchemy and some of the, uh, the artificial intelligence APIs that it's building out. Uh, this is really good if you want to take advantage of trying to learn some behavior or some trend of a big stack of data that you have and you just don't know what to do with. Uh, but you can take it a bit further. So if you're, if you're pretty technical, you want to take a look at something like Google TensorFlow, uh, which isn't quite DeepMind, but it's the open source version of some of their artificial intelligence. 
Uh, so you can use that to do something like a recurrent neural network. So if you want to, which is basically a way of saying, I've got a series of events, they all chain together and they hold their state so I can watch and get a trend and identify some sort of uh, a big event that could happen or possibly will happen as a result of what I'm seeing. Uh, and then you've got Android Auto. We talked a little bit about uh, Android Auto and CarPlay. Auto right now, the only one that's exposing an API. Uh, and it's doing it around messaging and uh, uh, the uh, audio control right now. So if you want to do some messaging and with the app, you could do that. Uh, then the uh, flip side of that is the SOC, so the system on a chip. Uh, so whenever you're talking about hardware, you're talking about small form factors or large form factors, depending on what you're trying to put in the car, what, you want to, what kind of device you want to give the customer. Uh, so if you're looking for something extremely small, really about the size of a button or a dime, uh, you're looking at something like the Intel Quark. It's uh, extremely low power, small form factor, uh, but still pretty performant for its size, and you can add a lot of functionality and sensors through it. Uh, if you want to step up from there, you look at something like Intel Atom, which today powers, I think, uh, some small tablets and small PDAs. So if you have something that's going to have screen interaction, that's probably going to be pretty good for that. Uh, something that's pretty interesting that's come out lately is TI's uh, 8S, uh, 3X chip, uh, 8S, is Advanced Driver Assistance uh, System. Uh, this one's kind of cool because it actually is developed specifically for driver monitoring and has facial recognition capabilities built with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about something pretty cool about that in a little bit. Uh, and then of course, if you're a hobbyist and you're trying to break into the space and you don't have capital behind you to, to create something that could take advantage of some of the smaller, more commercial chips, you always have the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. Uh, happy Pi Day, by the way. Very important thing. Uh, so I didn't plan that. Uh, they just scheduled this on that day. Uh, so these are some of the ways you can get into uh, to an entrance in, into this, uh, especially if you're trying to get into uh, to develop something for market. So as we talk about this market, so this is a talk about the cars in the marketplace. Uh, this marketplace is really something that's in motion. Uh, if you look at your classic markets, uh, this is really, they're usually a, you know, a shop, somebody sitting at a computer, somebody uh, in, in your restaurant. It's a very static location. You know exactly where they're at uh, and exactly why they're there. Uh, this marketplace, though, you've got people in vehicles moving around, and they're in different geographic locations and at different times. Uh, so if you look at the, the typical consumer and producer model, uh, that still exists in that connected marketplace. Uh, you still have drivers, you still have passengers, they act as your consumers uh, of whatever you're trying to sell them, and you still have the classic marketing uh, and services that are created as a result of them. But uh, what's kind of new in this place is you now have something that ties together and acts as a consumer and a, and a producer, and it's the vehicle. Like my cheesy animation. <laughs> uh, so, so you've got this vehicle that acts as a consumer because you, can, you have to maintain it, right? There's some sort of uh, consumer availability to it. But there's also the capacity for it to produce. It's going to produce a shitload of data that you're going to want to do something with, especially if you're trying to start up a company. Uh, so if you take these, the driver, the passenger, marketing services, and vehicle, and kind of put them in groups, you kind of get business opportunity categories. And I want to talk about three of those today. Uh, the first one, sorry, I'm going to do a Marco Rubio moment. The first one here is around the driver services, vehicles, and marketing. Uh, and this has to do with creating efficiency gains by giving people either back their time or helping them save some money in some fashion. So the first one I want to talk about is giving back time. Uh, so this is purchasing efficiencies. And what, what I mean here is finding a way to link multiple needs that someone has to allow them to use their car to accomplish many of them all at one time. And I want to use a personal example, and I think it's apropos down in Austin because this is going to sound pretty hipster. But I've got uh, two things that I get on a regular cadence. One is my milk and one is my formula. Uh, my milk that I get, and this happened by happenstance, my wife and I have a cappuccino maker, and we discovered through just buying milk in various places, only one type of milk made, made really, really good foam. Uh, so we only go to this one store, we don't really get anything else uh, other than that but that milk. And I also have an eight-month son, eight-month-old son, and he's got some dietary needs, and he's got a special formula that we get him that's only sold, sold at another store, and it's actually on a different part of town. So what ends up happening is, even though these are regular, recurrent, predictable uh, cadence buys, I end up going two long trips, wasting an hour or an hour and a half of my time, or separate trips, my, both my wife and I will waste our time doing this. So, if you guys ever used uh, Google Now, yeah, if you haven't used Google Now, basically it stalks you, will read your email, and will send you alerts about when you've got a package that's coming, uh, before I came to South by Southwest, right before I went to the airport, Google Now popped up and said, hey, now's a great time to leave for the airport to make your flight. And it was right, I made my flight. Uh, so if you think about that and start applying that to something like your purchase history, uh, and start looking at things like TensorFlow. You start looking, what are people's buying habits? What are they doing? What, they, what might they be doing next? We can imagine a world where, because of what it's watching and what it's doing, I'm now able to actually get some sort of reminder. Maybe I'm out in a location uh, near where I buy that milk. 
and uh, it's maybe it's a day before I know I'm going to buy that milk, but now it's going to warn me, hey, you know what, it's not time yet, but you may want to pick it up since you're right here and save me some time since I'm already there. Likewise, the same for my, uh, my formula. You could pull in if this and that and say if you're in some other recipes that kind of trigger some things that might go along uh, with that as well. Uh, you could also link it together that while you're buying your milk, maybe you want to buy some cookies. Maybe somebody wants to send you a, a, a coupon to buy some cookies or something. Uh, so that was for the uh, saving time. Let me talk about saving money. So if you imagine that you're you talked a little bit earlier uh, about the insurance companies and thinking about the OBT devices. Imagine you're an insurance company or a, uh, a financial institution or a, a, an owner of a lot of mechanical maintenance stations. Uh, and you start giving out a bunch of these OBD2 devices to your customers. So they're driving around, you're, you're tracking the mileage, you know how many miles they put on their car. Uh, you can actually integrate with Edmunds.com, and I think the NHTSA provides this data too, but Edmunds.com will actually tell you the uh, maintenance intervals uh, by the manufacturers for every single car that you get. So you can actually find out when's, how often does this manufacturer recommend an oil change, a brake change, a tire change, these sorts of things. So you can combine that, <coughs> excuse me, and start looking at your fleet of vehicles. Maybe you've got 10,000, 20,000 cars out there that are racking up miles and you're watching the various cadences. And you do something like TensorFlow or Watson and have it watch to find when, when is their approximate range when it's the best time to signal to maybe 10,000 of those Honda Civics that's in that pool. And then you reach out to somebody like Service King or Jiffy Loop and say, hey, I've got this, I've got 10,000 Honda Civics. I can send them to you right now uh, if you want to give us a discount. I will, I will provide a, a you know, discount oil change send it out to them and this is the right time for them. They're very prime, right? So this is, instead of a car dealership sending out something that's every three months that may or may not have been the, the amount of time you drove, I actually know these people are right ready for the oil change. Uh, so by doing that, you, uh, you actually provide savings for the customer. You provide a lot of just-in-time inventory capability for the, uh, for the maintenance stations because now, now they know I need to stock up on the, the filter that goes with the Honda Civic and the oil type that goes with the Honda Civic. Uh, so you create a new com commodity purchase that's in a bulk buy that saves the, uh, the consumer money and actually probably brings more business to the uh, servicer as well. So now I'm gonna talk about monetization. This is a combination of passenger and kind of marketing and sales. Uh, Mike alluded to this earlier, this is literally, you've got a captive audience. They are going nowhere, well, sorry, they are going somewhere, they're driving around, but they're locked in that vehicle, they can't get out. Uh, so you, they have nothing else to do. Now they probably could talk to each other, but that's the last thing we want. Uh, they're probably on their smartphones or they're probably staring out the window. So we could start talking about how do we create new passenger experiences. Uh, so way back in the 1930s, I guess, they were thinking about the future of playing. To, what game is that? Scrabble, maybe. Uh, you, you could start creating, finding ways. So you have Android Auto, you have the ability to open up the APIs. You can start making games that are actually interactive inside the car with all the passengers. So this wouldn't be just a smartphone or device, maybe it's Bluetooth enabled. But you can start getting uh, the ability for the, the people to kind of gamify with each other. Uh, kind of build up a, a nice rapport with the people in the car. You could also do, if you're like me, I like knowing the history around the stuff uh, uh, that's near me. Uh, you know, the Anton's across the street, that's where Stevie Ray Vaughan had to start. That's kind of cool stuff that I like to find out. Uh, the, uh, if you hooked up something with Android Auto uh, and Wikipedia, you could kind of pull up kind of historical information uh, to talk about uh, what's, in the, what's nearby and what they could do. Uh, but there's also something that's a little more interesting, and this is around infotainment and advertising. So, uh, a lot, of we, a lot of us have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, right? We can stream video pretty much wherever we're at. Uh, when you're out in the car, you, people are going to be watching these videos every now and then, but when you're out in the car, if you think about the current model that you have today for advertising, it consists of two major categories. You've got bulletin boards, which are static, right? They're only in one location. You don't know who the person is. You have an idea who travels that route, but that's about it. And then you have radio ads. And the best you're getting there is maybe a target demographic. Uh, what you don't have is a lot more information about where they are, what they're doing, what they might want to be doing, and who they, who they specifically are. So if we think about this from, a, uh, from the connected car perspective, let's assume I've gone to a movie, and the car knows I'm in a, mark, a parking lot of a movie and I'm getting out, let's say, at 6 p.m. Uh, if I'm a restaurant here, I might want to give a targeted ad to somebody around that same time frame that says, hey, you're already out and about, how would you like to go get some dinner at my place? Or how would you like to go see the show if, I'm, if I've just finished dinner? Uh, the greatest hurdle you're going to get to get somebody to go somewhere is getting them outside of the house. They're in the car, they're already going. Like they're already, that, that big barrier is already gone. So now you've got an opportunity to start uh, picking together and uh, identifying where they're at, you know, what time of day. You're probably even going to know who they're at, who they are, because they've got their smartphone on them. You'll know the weather, right? So you can tailor it to uh, different weather patterns and what it's like outside. So you can do zoo escapes or, you know, aquarium escapes and that sort of thing. Uh, so the last one I wanted to talk about was the services. 
and uh, this is the grouping of the vehicle, the driver, and the sales. Uh, here we want to talk a little bit about the, the, the large amount of data that's in this group. Uh, I want to talk about a reinvention of the experience for the driver, uh, and a little bit of a, uh, a ride share opportunity, and something that kind of sounds futuristic that's really going on right now. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about data aggregation. Uh, these, uh, the OBD2 ports, uh, the software OBD2 SDKs that are actually tracking where you're at through the various algorithms, are gathering, like I said earlier, just a shit ton of data about what you're doing. So you're, if you think about the, the data points, it's capturing a lot of how hard do you brake, how fast do you accelerate, uh, you know, where are you driving, for how long are you driving a certain speed over for a certain time. So we really know, really, your behavioral equity. Right? This is a lot of your behavior. This is telling who you are. The insurance companies already know this, right? They're looking at your how, how fast you're braking to, to see how you're gonna, uh, what kind of risk you're going to be. So, as a consumer, you now have a piece of equity that you can trade in with the company to kind of give them some insight into, to give you some sort of, uh, give them a better idea of what your real risk is, uh, or what your real profile is as a customer. It gives them a little more insight as to what kind of person you are, and they might tailor a service for that. Uh, if, you know, uh, if you heard recently here at South by Southwest, we also announced uh, Capital One did with our new integration with Alexa. You can do the same thing with Alexa APIs uh, with a connected car. You could uh, hook up something to where you know you've got it in your connected car. You could ask it, "Hey Alexa, where's my car?" Or "Hey Alexa, how much gas do I have?" Uh, or if you're a parent, "Hey Alexa, how's my son driving right now?" Yeah, that could be pretty pretty important information if you're a parent. Uh, this next one is my favorite. This is the purchase from car, and it's not just because I'm really lazy. I have, uh, I've got the, the 6S Plus. This is the big phone, right? The, the one that sticks you every time you sit down. Uh, whenever I go through a drive-thru, uh, I, I always go through this uh, routine where I make my order, I get up to the, the, uh, the pay window, and I go through this dance where I press really hard on the brake, I lift my hips up in the air, and I either pull out my phone or I pull out my wallet to get it to the, to the person. And then they hand me the stuff, and it's this big shuffle while they can make card back, and I'm trying to put everything back, everything back in uh, place. We can make that experience much better, and there's, there's a really easy way we can do that. Uh, you can actually partner with someone like Starbucks, uh, or somebody that has a, a real need to make sure the speed and the flow is constant and smooth from at least the, eliminating the payment time transaction, right? If you're in, if you're in line, you never want to wait, uh, and if you're a, a restaurateur, you definitely don't want your customers waiting that long because you want to make more money by driving them through. So how can you do this? You could enable some type of transponder at the drive through window that could actually detect what a car and what the car is when it's there. Uh, you could use something like the ADAS processor from TI. Uh, did you guys see the MasterCard thing with the uh, selfie verification? You guys seen that? You can take a selfie and blink at it and it verifies your payment. Uh, so you could do the same thing. So you, it's basically adding a, a multi-factor authentication to your payment uh, opportunity by, you, know, you could smile at the camera, give it a wink, and turn your head to the right, and that's your authentication uh, signal, kind of like your swipe on an Android phone or something like that. Uh, but stuff like that can actually you know, really reinvent the way we purchase things as we're driving through things. This can help the dry cleaners in other places as well. Uh, and so lastly, there's a, uh, this, this idea of the independent ride share. So Uber and Lyft make a lot of money today when we pay them, uh, and the drivers make a little bit of money off of that. You can envision a uh, future here where someone's gonna find a way to open source that capability and have independently certified Uber and Lyft drivers. Uh, it won't be called Uber and Lyft, it'll be called somebody else. Uh, but they could team together and take their uh, OBD2 port and NFC uh, or an Apple Pay capability and charge people for rides. Uh, but you could also do this with road trips or with, uh, if you've got high school kids that are trying to share the cost of gas. Uh, you could take something like our uh, Labs app, the Group Loop app, where you're able to aggregate a bunch of transactions and kind of split them up amongst each other uh, and then charge them back using either your sale or your uh, uh, Square device uh, or some other payment platform. Uh, so I told you I wanted to share something that kind of sounded futuristic that's actually in play today. And of course it's from Europe. Uh, this is something that Mike was actually involved in. There's this concept of a remote delivery locker. Uh, if you're like me, you order a lot of stuff off of Amazon and it gets shipped back to your house and it, it arrives at my house while I'm at work. Sometimes that's gifts for my wife or my sons and I don't want them seeing it. I would much rather have an option when I'm on Amazon to say, here's actually my car. Instead of going to my house, arrive to my car, use the device to pop open the trunk, pop it in and close it. So Volvo and DHL have a partnership right now where you can actually do that. Where the delivery vehicle after it actually arrives to the car, can pop open the trunk, put it in, close it, and notifies you that you got your, uh, your delivery service. And I gotta think you guys in FedEx would be interested because you can imagine arriving to a large parking garage and knocking out a whole bunch of deliveries all at once. Um, the last thing I want to wrap up with this. 
Uh, a lot of you come to South by Southwest because you're makers, you're trying to make a difference with where you're at. Uh, you understand what we, what we do in South by Southwest and here in Austin and here in the, uh, the maker communities, we're trying to make a difference and improve everyone's lives. The connected car in the future, it's going to hit a plateau pretty soon. Uh, as Michael said, look, right now we've got smart cars but that are on dumb roads. The infrastructure that we're on today isn't going to sustain a uh, connected car future. We're going to have to get better at material science and construction science. Uh, so that we can enable things like the better location awareness of others, route tracing, uh, B2B communication. And it's only going to happen if we start getting people educated to understand uh, how to create really great uh, materials and really great hardware. And then talking to our politicians to make sure that they understand infrastructure actually is going to be really important uh, as the roadways change, as we repurpose uh, driving uh, sorry, uh, parking garages and that sort of thing. Um, I want to thank you all for your time. Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I think that's it. All right, uh, thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be here for any questions if you have any. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Southwest Southwest. Thank you.